So we, this this um this session we have um now is um called um how will we um know how far we have come, and so um it, it's an important question to think about on an ongoing basis because this is really about the whole notion as we've t discussed in various sessions, the notion of measurement, monitoring, and evaluation. And that's a really critical thing to be doing on an ongoing basis to make sure we're making progress in the right areas that we can document we've made progress and identify where there's still gaps and progress to be made. So we have a, a battery of, of presentations here. I'm gonna give a little bit of background information of a project I've worked on with, with um, some of my colleagues at ESDC and Statistics Canada and others at the federal level. And then we'll have a presentation um, from from a group that's going to be discussing um, dynamics of disability. So it'll be some new results from the 2017 Canadian Survey on Disability. Another group then will be d d talking about um, the Canadian Survey of Disability that's happening in 2022 and uh, the development of a new accessibility module. Um, so creating an accessible future, it's de de described as um, in, in for this 2022 Survey of Disability. So, um, and then lastly, we'll have um, a bit of a talk with, with um, Tamara um, Tranquila um, from the United Nations about the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, um, the monitoring by civil society. So, so the piece I wanna just give a high level overview is a project um, I've been doing with some of my colleagues who are listed here, Amir Mofidi, who's actually here. He's one of the um, ambassadors with the bands. Um, Arif Jetha, um, Pam Leigh, he's also here, and then Alexis Butkin. But this, um, this project is a really good example of what somebody mentioned earlier, I think Steve mentioned about government as a partner. Um, this project, really shows how if we work together, we can do really great work. Um, you know, even though I led this project, so much depended on the great data resources and the expertise of people in ESDC and Statistics Canada and many others to help put together this project. So I just wanna emphasize that part, of, uh, that, that this is a really collaborative effort. Um, so um, this was something where we were tasked to uh, answer this following question. Um, what would be the benefits to Canadian society in the reference year 2017? And we're using that year because that's when the CSD was done. So we had data from that year 2017. So if Canada was accessible and inclusive in all domains relevant to full participation. So this is looking at all social domains, not exclusively on, on work roles, but we do drill down on work as well. And I have that gold bar there because um, this is a gold standard. This is the ideal. If we were fully accessible and inclusive as a society, this is what we could gain from where we are at today. So we drilled down, you know, doing something what we described as a bottom-up approach where we had very detailed micro-level data to build up the experiences of individuals in Canadian society and aggregate it up across all of Canada in these 14 domains. So we were looking at healthcare expenses, out-of-pocket expenses, output and productivity issues, quality of life and social role engagement, life expectancy, informal caregiving, children with disabilities, human rights, transportation, tourism, general productivity, administration of social safety net programs, pensions, and then looking at what we described as a market multiplier effect, so all those spillover effects to the broader market because people have higher incomes and have, are, are more, have more consumption ability because they're not in poverty. So we tried to be comprehensive as best we could of all the social domains that would be affected by having a fully inclusive and accessible Canada. And, and this is um, just our conceptual model. You probably won't see the details here, but there's those 14 honeycombs of different domains that I've just listed and that overarching research question of what we would what would be the benefits to Canadian society if we were fully inclusive and accessible. So this is the, the findings uh, at a high level, and I'll just highlight the key ones. So the total benefits we estimated um, for the calendar year 2017 was $338 billion. And that's just one year's of benefits, and that's 17.6% of GDP. The labor market component on its own was $62.2 billion. Um, so that's 3.2% of GDP. So a huge potential that is not being tapped into 
because we're not fully accessible and inclusive today, but that a potential that we could reach out to and, and move towards as a, a gold standard target where we'd like to be ideally. I'll, I'll just um, detail some of the other items here. So, so um, as you see in the top line here, we have the total benefits, um, lower health care expenses at tw about $20 billion, the productivity component is $62 billion, quality of life and social role engagement as a, at $132 billion, the spillover effects to the larger market um, at $76 billion, and then market multiplier effects at um, $47 billion for that total of $337.7 billion. And then this is just my last slide because I was giving them my minute warning. Um, so this, the, the other important point we wanted to get at was this is not going to be a cost to government necessarily because the spillover effects result in lots of tax revenue, higher labor market earnings result in higher tax revenue. So we tried to identify how much revenue the government would get from, from these, this expansion of markets essentially. So, so as you can see here, um, we have both federal level um, expansion of, of revenue and provincial level expansion of revenue through various tax venues. So tax revenue from output and productivity impacts was $17 billion for the federal government and $18 billion for provincial and territorial governments. The total sum of all these tax revenues at the federal level is about $30 billion and about $33 billion for the provincial government. So, so quite a, a large windfall for government that can then be used for various program and service provision um, opportunities that would be help realize some of these benefits of being fully inclusive and accessible. So, so there's a win-win there, and, and, and I'll just reiterate the point that this was really um, uh, uh, possible because of the great data resources we have here in Canada, um, and, and I, I, it really helped to be able to drill down on a lot of the details of these, these things. This report, by the way, is available on the D, that don't, remember that the drilling that's going on next door, so this, don't panic. <laughs> This, this, the report is quite extensive, is available on the DWC website, and it, which is um, also um, a page within our CRWDP website if people want more details about it. So thank you. And so now I'm going to um, take, move it to the, the presentations we have here with our panel. And I've been asked for efficiency to just um, introduce people by their first name. So the first presenters will be, um, will be Gail Fawcett and Stuart Morris. And we'll just get up your slides. So, so I'm Gail Fawcett. I'm actually with Employment and Social Development Canada. And I'm a researcher uh, in the area of disability. And uh, I'm going to be presenting today with Stuart, who is my sort of equivalent over at Statistics Canada. And we collaborate on a lot of research together. And uh, today, we're going to be uh, talking about our uh, sort of recent uh, research that was just published by Statistics Canada on uh, Tuesday, uh, December 3rd. And it's up on StatCan's website. If you haven't seen it, try to look for the daily. Uh, on Statistics Canada's website, and it'll take you to it. So, um, and that's the, uh, for us, sort of the culmination of months and months of, of working together. So, um, and anyway, and it's also, it's using the 2017 Canadian Survey on Disability and, uh, and using some new content on the dynamics of disability. And just to sort of let you know, the two new questions that were added uh, to look at this, um, we started working on them back in 2014. So that's, in order to fill a data gap, you need a lot of lead time. And so the design, the testing, um, and uh, you know, eventually fielding of the survey, and now we've got the data. So, and about a, um, anyway, so this is actually the first presentation of, uh, of this particular project. So, um, uh, yesterday uh, I was in the session on unconscious bias. And so I'm actually, I brought PowerPoint, but I'm going to skip most of it as I usually do and confuse everybody. So I'm just kind of going to go off script here. Um, but this, this and, and I'm doing that because yesterday uh, the, the session on unconscious bias made a big impression on me. And I think that would have been a great segue into this research. Uh, Tammy Yates, who's down there, um, she spoke yesterday about the, uh, the stereotype, that traditional stereotype 
stereotype of disability as something that's constant, uh, not non-changing and permanent, and that there was sort of, that was people with disabilities, and then there were people without disabilities. And she talked about the space in between, and really what we're talking about is that space in between, because it's a lot bigger, I think, than a lot of people realize. Maybe not the people in this room, but I think a lot of people don't realize that space exists, how big it is and how complicated it is. And uh, so that's sort of where we're, we're headed with this. So we've known for about 30 years, there's been a lot of research on people who are in that in-between space. And, uh, and, and it's been called all kinds of different things, but most recently, I think most people will recognize it as episodic disabilities. Um, and that sort of culminated uh, last year in a private member's bill. Uh, in Parliament, and uh, that led to a HUMA, and a report came out in March, and a lot of people in this room, actually, this time last year, were running off to testify. Um, so, uh, but we, we've been working on this uh, uh, for quite some time, and uh, we're going to give you a, a bit of an idea uh, as to what that space in between looks like. Uh, and also, uh, what we're doing here today is providing you that kind of profile. What does it look like? How many are there? Um, you know, sort of what are the issues? But there's a lot of other work going on out there, and uh, I would mention uh, another project called ACEST, and it stands for Accommodation accommodating and communicating about episodic disabilities. And it's a very, it's a large multi-year project that's going on uh, with an, a number of people in this room. And they're looking at um, um, the sort of very real practical tools for dealing with uh, um, these, these, the space in between. And so this is to support that type of work. And that's how, I think getting back to what Emil said, how we can all, how it really takes us all working together to, to kind of move this thing forward. So uh, we ended up, uh, I won't get into a lot of the details, but using two little questions, which was all we had space for, and it was a big challenge, and we learned, we learned a lot in the testing. Uh, we came up with four groups. Uh, so these are the groups that we ended up with. You can use those questions to come up, you can reconfigure them in ways um, for different purposes. For our purpose, we were very focused on um, on, uh, on employment, and these four groups operated a bit differently. So I'm just going to give you a very quick kind of overview. So you'll see continuous, which is, that's our traditional stereotype. Okay. Oh, that's our traditional stereotype. And um, uh, is that... Is that five minutes for the two of us? Oh, oh, sorry. Okay, so and so so that's our traditional stereotype. Then then there's progressive. Oh, sorry. So then there's progressive, and uh, those are for people whose whose limitations are worsening over time. They may they may have some type of uh, uh, dynamic, but the the. The, the big thing for them is that the, uh, the limitation is increasing over time. Then we have recurrent, and those are people who can have up to a month, uh, not always have a month, but they can have up to a month where they don't have any limitation. And that's sort of that off, on again, off again pattern where it's easy to look like you don't have a disability. Then there's fluctuating, and those are people, they never get as much as a month without uh, feeling limited, but they do have fluctuations, and it's kind of going all over the place, and uh, so those are the, those last three were the three dynamic groups. Okay. So of our 6.2 million adults with disabilities from the uh, 2017 CSD, uh, you can see that 61% um, actually experience some level of dynamics. So that's the space in between. That's how big that space in between is. It's the majority of people with disabilities don't have that nice, neat, um, stereotype upon which our, our biases are based, our assumptions about people with disability and our programs and policies and eligibility requirements are based upon that stereotype. But that stereotype applies to the 2.4 million that comprise less than 40%. Of the, of the population with disabilities. So, so it's a lot bigger, and I don't think I really need to convince anybody in this room, but this is a wider message maybe for sort of changing attitudes in society. 
uh, and people can move from one category to the other across the life course. These are not static groups. You can find people in every group with diff the same underlying condition. They can, across their life course, they might be found in all different groups. So just to give you a quick overview of the um, sort of what it looks like, age, um, recurrent disabilities are more common among younger people. Progressive disabilities start to take over for older age groups. Um, for, uh, on, on the basis of gender, women are more likely to experience fluctuating limitations than men. Men are more likely to uh, uh, experience continuous the traditional uh, stereotype. And um, one quick thing I'd like to point out is that among youth, uh, women, uh, men are much more likely uh, than women to experience continuous disabilities, and women are more likely than men to experience both recurrent and fluctuating. So for young, for youth, for young adults, um, really uh, there is a big gender thing, so I'm going to hand it over. Okay. Uh, sorry. <laughs> we, need, we need more time. That's okay. So we're going to be doing a um, slide on employment and workplace accommodations. Um, how much time do I have? I've got two. No, okay. I'm so sorry. <clears throat> this is going to be Take very high level. <clears throat> so clearly, um, um, persons with disabilities need work, and they need the supports to be able to do that work. Um, this can be particularly challenging for those who have some type of disability dynamic. So if you can imagine, if you've got a disability that is not constant, that it's changing either in intensity or changing in frequency, that's going to create a challenge to you as the employee and to the employer who's trying to provide you supports. I'll raise my hand. Next slide. Okay. So what this table is showing you is clearly what we're seeing is that when you just look at persons with disabilities overall, you get one message. But as soon as you break down that group into different disability dynamic, you start to see changes in the employment rate. The persons who with recurrent have the highest employment rate. Persons with progressive have the lowest. Okay, next slide. So in terms of the, what we're talking about is uh, persons who are employed between the ages of 25 to 64. So what we see is that when we look at employment experiences, those with progressive or fluctuating limitations share somewhat similar experiences than those with recurrent or continuous. So what we start to see in the employment profile is that there's actually a grouping where you see the progressive and the fluctuating share similar characteristics versus the continuous and the recurrent groups. Um, and so what we do find is that that impact has more of an effect on persons with progressive and fluctuating. Next slide. I'm not going to go into this slide because I only have a minute and it's actually one of the most complicated concepts to talk about. <laughs> However, I am here all day for anybody who wants to talk to me about it afterwards. <laughs> so let's go to the next slide. Okay, so what we're looking at here is um, requirements for workplace accommodations. And what we see is that, once again, when we look at the progressive and the fluctuating, about half of that employee population require at least one type of accommodation in the workplace. If you look at those with recurrent or continuous, it's about a third. What we find is in all cases, um, the highest requirements tend to be around flexible work arrangement. The lowest requirements tend to be around human and technical supports. Next slide. Okay, so very quickly, let me just um, explain what we're talking about with level of need. Um, I actually had to create a, a somewhat sophisticated calculation to get this very, what looks like a very simple chart. And basically the idea is that if the person required at least one accommodation in the workplace, did he or she get it? Um, so if a person required three and they only got two, they had some needs met. If they require three and they got three, they had all needs met. If they require three and they got nothing, they had no needs met, to give you an idea of what it looks like. So what we find is that um, for flexible work arrangements, um, in terms of statistical significance testing, um, we don't see differences in between the groups. So 
we can talk. Oh, talk. Okay, we can talk about it collectively as a whole, uh, which is um, on average as a whole about 70% of persons um, uh, have all their needs met, uh, and 8% have some, and uh, 22, around 22% have none of their needs met. Once again, this is a very major paper. The paper itself is uh, over 30 pages long, so quite a bit of analysis, and uh, hopefully there'll be another time when we can go about it in more detail. So I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gail and Stuart. And our, our next group of presenters are, are Mike Burns and Pam Leahy. Okay, thank you, Dr. Tompa, and thank you, Gail and Stuart, for that excellent presentation on the analysis of the results. I just want to now look forward a little bit to 2022, but also at the same time, I'll set the context a little bit around the Canadian Survey on Disability, just so people understand a sort of the behind the scenes look at what goes into the survey and sort of the steps it takes to get us to the point where Gail and, and Stuart are able to do the tremendous analysis that they've been doing. Um, so as you may of you, many of you already do know, Stats Canada has been collecting disability data for more than 35 years now. Uh, the Canadian Survey on Disability is the most comprehensive data set for persons with disabilities in Canada, and it's conducted in partnership with ESDC, who are tremendous partners in funding the survey and also doing the analysis. Um, the survey itself in 2022 will have a sample size of approximately 50,000. Uh, sure. Okay. Okay. The survey um, in 2022 will have a sample size of approximately 50,000. Um, it's an eligible population that comes from our census of Canadian ad adults aged 15 and over living in private dwellings in one of the 10 provinces or territories. Um, the 2021 census administers a set of questions who identify if a person has a limitation in their daily activities. From that set of questions, that's where the sample is drawn for the Canadian Survey on Disability. Um, the survey itself is collected in an internet online collection platform as well as a telephone interview uh, type of format. And in 2022, we'll be adding new content specifically around accessibility to react to the passage of the Accessible Canada Act in July. Uh, just to highlight some of the milestone timelines for the survey, right now we're doing some outreach and consultations with partners and participating in events like, like we are today. So, it's a great opportunity to reach out and identify some of the current and emerging data priorities and things that are really of need to the community and disability organizations. So that work is being basically starting now and will continue it into the spring of next year, at which point we'll start the development of the survey questions themselves and then begin a period of testing. All questions, as I'll show in my uh, next slides, are rigorously tested at StatsCan and must pass a series of, of very rigorous tests in order to make it onto the survey at the end of the day. Um, the collection for the survey in 2022 will be the first half of 2022 starting in January, at which point when collection finishes we'll begin processing the data and then have it released about a year later. So we can go to the next slide. So the core themes, I'll just highlight some of the core themes of the survey that are sort of the, the, the core content that, that creates the questions. Um, so essentially we have questions on aids and assistive devices which identify which devices people use, uh, which devices people need, and if they do not have these devices, we identify what's the barrier that's preventing them from getting these devices, whether it's cost or availability or accessibility. We identify these uh, types of information up front in the survey. We also have core content around labor force activities. There are many of the same questions that appear on the labor force survey at Stats Canada. Uh, but we identify again if a person is employed in which industry occupation. Um, we also collect information on employment equity, which is uh, legislated by law in the survey. So there's some questions there around workplace accommodations and if people have the accommodations they need in order to participate in the labor force. We also have a series of questions on education and educational experiences of persons with disabilities, whether or not uh, they're still in school and what sort of accommodations, again, they need in school. Um, we also collect information on supports and therapies and if people are using medications or if they can't get the medications that they need, again, what's the barrier that's preventing them from getting access to these services and medications, which is a key uh, component of the survey. Um, finally, towards the end of the survey, we have a series of questions on self-rated health, um, access to the internet and other questions. And this is where we may see some questions on accessibility also sort of fit into the, the, the sort of core content of the survey. 
Finally, at the end of the survey, we end up linking to the tax files, which adds information around income of respondents, which is very useful again in our analysis. So just a little peek behind the scenes of the questionnaire design process. How do the questions actually make it onto the survey? Um, we go through a series of, of steps at Stats Canada and we ensure that all questions are adequately tested. This includes testing within Stats Canada, within the groups that are working on the survey development, as well as external testing that takes place in cities across Canada in both English and French in a series of qualitative testing rounds that we do with our questionnaire design folks. Uh, we have to ensure that the questions are very easy to administer. Um, both in, in, all over the internet as well as on the telephone. So we have, since we have multiple modes of collection, these questions have to be very easy to administer. And also, again, collect accurate information. If the questions are misleading or inaccurate in their design, if there's a flaw in that, it'll be uh, inherent in the information that we collect and the analysis that we do uh, won't be quite as useful as, as it in, is intended to be. Um, we also have to ensure that questions are easy to process and we're able to uh, produce the data set as quickly as possible. And again, questions have to be respondent friendly and interviewer friendly so respondents can complete the surveys on their own at home or over the telephone with the help of an interviewer. Um, just a quick look at some of the design players that go into making questions. So we have the survey managers such as myself, we have our external clients and we also have um, our collection partners who build the application, collect the data, and then process it for us. And I'll just highlight our questionnaire design resource team are the people that we work very closely with to design the questions, and they're the folks that also review and test the questions, and ultimately at the end of the day, they have the approval or the recommendation to send that for approval to our chief statistician who approves the survey content. So he's a very key uh, component of the survey. Um, and just the last slide before. Uh, again, just some considerations as we're starting to think about questions around accessibility and adding new questions to the survey, we just have to ensure that we meet uh, several considerations that questions are relevant, that they're simple, that they're easy to read, uh, short is always better, as we usually say, and if we can ever find questions that already exist on other surveys, that's very useful because we can sort of skip some of the uh, testing uh, steps along the way and, and ensure that the question works and then we have uh, a benchmark for data on other surveys as well. And again, the most important thing also is to minimize the respondent, respondent burden because at the end of the day, if a respondent is on the telephone being asked a series of questions, we want to make sure that we get to the end of the survey, we make it as easy on the respondent as possible and we get the data that we want to collect. So without further ado, I'll hand the microphone over to Pamela who will talk a little bit about the accessibility module that we're hoping to add to the survey in 2022. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, my name is uh, Pam Leahy, and uh, I am a research advisor with uh, uh, Employment and Social Development Canada. Um, and I uh, am working with um, Gail from a Disability. I work um, in accessibility. Um, so together we're working with StatsCan, um, as Mike mentioned, to uh, develop a uh, module for accessibility that will go on the 2022 um, CSD. And um, I want to share with you that even though um, this accessibility module is new um, to StatsCan, it's actually a fairly new concept um, um, in terms of um, a survey that will um, identify accessibility uh, needs uh, or the, the people that are uh, experiencing accessibility barriers. Um, I, I'm bringing um, uh, the design of accessibility, um, I, I'm looking at that from multiple perspectives. So from the perspective of a researcher, an academic, a professional, and a person with lived experience. And all of that was not on my slides, so um, <laughs> uh, I will skip um, the first part. But I want to actually spend um, most of the time on uh, methodological, methodological approach. So if we could go to that slide. Um, 
I, uh, create, I did an environmental scan across multiple jurisdictions, and uh, what does exist is a lot of instruments. Oh, only two minutes left, really? Okay. Um, on um, what that we'll look at adapting uh, for this uh, module. Um, but really, our vision is to have uh, a module that embeds the principles of equality and independence and choice. Um, that we see in the human rights um, legislation, the ACA that um, is, has been created right now, uh, and the UNCRPD um, um, vision of um, equality for people with disabilities. So that means looking at it from a relative perspective um, and not just checking off a, a box, but it needs to look at the person environment fit and the experience that people with disabilities have in any place or space has to be on par with that of people who do not have disabilities. Um, and in that, in, in that respect, then we will have reached um, uh, as full, in, full inclusion and uh, met our vision for an accessible Canada. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, this module is only part of um, a data strategy um, that is happening across the government of Canada in multiple uh, branches um, and divisions. Um, so, f of course, consideration for this module, as Mike said, we will look at um, that, that already, the content that already exists and um, what we can take from that and adapt that for our needs. Um, and then, of course, um, it's the, we're looking at the impact um, on other survey content and, you know, can it be, is it comparable? Um, because we, we need to ensure comparability uh, um, across surveys and um, across years. Um, and, of course, as Mike already indicated, it must pass rigorous um, qualitative testing. I have two questions that I want to pose to the room right now, and I'm here all day. So please come and hunt me down um, if you have anything that you want to add, because this is, um, I'm here to consult with the room um, and get feedback from external stakeholders. So my two questions, I just got the red hand. So my two questions is, what are the strengths and weaknesses of using the relative approach of accessibility? And what else should we consider in our question design? Um, and those are the two questions I'm hoping that you can, you can uh, reflect on during the day and um, I'm happy to take that feedback back when we go sit at the table for our question design, which will be the next stage of this module development. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thanks, Mike and Pam. And then our last um, presenter is Tabitha Tranquillas, who is Senior <coughs> Policy Advisor with the Canadian Human Rights Commission. And she'll be talking about monitoring by civil society with the CRPD. Did you want to come up here? Speak oh, no, I'll, I'll sit here. Yeah, <laughs> um, as they say, now for something completely different <laughs> in, in, in a lot of different ways. I think our first presenter said she was going to go off script. Um, those of you who know me know that uh, most often I speak with no script. Uh, and so that's what I'll do today. And I'm really hoping I'll never get to the two minute uh, warning so that we have some time for questions. Um, so uh, I just, you know, I, as, as Emil said, I'm with the Canadian Human Rights Commission. I'm a bit of an outlier on this panel in a, a couple of different ways. Uh, I'm not a researcher. I know nothing about statistics. Um, and of course, the commission is not strictly government. Um, and so we're not government, we're not civil society. We sit somewhere in the space in between those things. Uh, so unfortunately, I, I won't be um, building on anything else that has been said here today. I'm more going to loop back to what Steve was talking about this morning with respect to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities um, and just fill you in on some exciting opportunities uh, with respect to the work that the Canadian Human Rights Commission is doing. So to start with, if we look at uh, the context of what we're all here over these two days to talk about, um, we know that employment uh, remains a preeminent concern uh, for persons with disabilities. Uh, federally, if we're talking about human rights complaints, 
Um, of course, the Commission is the federal body responsible for dealing with human rights complaints. Uh, we know that over 50% of the complaints that we receive every year are related uh, to disability, and 84% of those complaints are related to employment. Uh, which means that 44% of all human rights complaints at the federal level are filed by persons with disabilities as a result of issues that they have faced in relation to employment in the federal sector. If we look across the country, uh, the numbers are very similar in most jurisdictions, ranging from about 17% of the overall caseload in Quebec uh, to over 50% in Nova Scotia. So this is a significant issue right across the country. What else do we know? We know the CRPD, um, Canada's international obligation, uh, not just the CRPD, but all of the uh, seven treaties to which Canada is a party speak about employment um, and inclusion and accessibility. Uh, we know that there are significant gaps that need to be filled, uh, and uh, I think that's why we're all here today. Um, Steve was talking this morning a bit about the CRPD and the monitoring process in Geneva and such, and, and, um, and that's all great. I want to build, I want to take that as kind of my starting point. Um, certainly, you know, it, it's great to have a monitoring process like that uh, where Canada is held to account uh, for implementing the obligations uh, that it has under the, the international agreements that it has signed. But of course, there are some significant limitations to that process. Uh, you know, the CRPD is expansive. Uh, 33 articles covering everything. Work and employment, uh, which we're here to talk about today, is one article of 33. Um, the reporting process is really compact. Uh, there's not a lot of space uh, to really delve into conversations. Uh, and figure out what solutions may be. And we're talking to, it's been my experience, I've done a lot of these things, we're often talking to a body of experts that we get stuck for a, a good portion of the time talking about federalism. Uh, and, and what does it mean to exist in a federal state and what powers the federal government who's responsible for signing on to these things actually has over implementing. Um, any of them on the ground. Uh, so, you know, there are some significant limitations. The reviews happen once every four years in Geneva. It's, uh, when we really think about that, it's sometimes of little applicability to people's actual lives, and you can understand that. Um, and, and it's a very formal process. You know, it's not inclusive. Not everybody can get on a plane and go to, to Geneva and, and speak to a committee. Um, and so that's not, that's not really in keeping with the principles of the CRPD, uh, nothing about us without us. So, so the CRPD is a bit unique in that it tries to correct some of those problems uh, by obligating uh, a, uh, a state party to the, to the convention to designate uh, an independent monitoring mechanism at home to do domestic monitoring. And that is, that's the commission. Um, it just, with the passage of the ACA, the Commission was given that designation. Uh, and so we're just at the beginning of a long road. Um, and what I wanted to, uh, to spend my last couple of minutes here talking about uh, is that, that process that we're going through right now. You know, the, the title of this panel is How Will We Know That We're Making Progress? Um, and as the monitoring mechanism, we have the same question. Uh, that we don't, we don't know what that, what that looks like. We don't know what monitoring means, what, what it should be producing, um, and we don't know how best to ensure that the people whose lives the CRPD actually needs to affect, uh, you know, the people in this room, uh, persons living with disabilities, um, they need to not only be you know, consulted in this process, they need to be involved in this process. The CRPD means nothing if it means nothing to the people who actually uh, are impacted or, uh, by the potential of it. Um, and so, uh, again, right at the beginning of a process, but I just wanted to let everyone know uh, that the commission over the course of the next eight to 10 months or so, uh, we'll be doing coast to coast to coast engagement uh, with um, everybody uh, who we can reach uh, in, all, in all jurisdictions, 
to figure out what, what monitoring might look like. What is it you want us to measure? How will you know that we're making progress? And not just in terms of numbers. You know, but yeah, some indicators, some numbers for sure, but we really want to know what does it mean to monitor what day-to-day -day life is like um, for someone who's living with a disability and what, how does, what does that look like? Uh, we know how to do reports and send them to Geneva. We don't know what, what it is that communities actually need to make these things a real living, breathing, tangible thing in, in their daily lives. Um, and so I, uh, I, I guess that's, that's going to be where I'm going to end, and I haven't yet gotten the two-minute warning, so yay. Um, and I just, uh, I thought it was important to come here and, uh, and speak with you all who are such important, uh, you know, rights holders in this process uh, to just let you know of, uh, of the plan, and, and um, certainly I'll be around, uh, and we can speak in more detail, but you'll be hearing more from me if you haven't already. Thanks very much. Great. <laughs> Thanks so much, Tabitha. Um, so I'm assuming because we kept on time, we have some time for questions from the audience or comments. There's four questions in Slido. Okay. Um, I don't have uh, my phone with me, but will you? So I have two quick questions. Uh, I previously received at work a, um, I guess it was a briefing on the 2017 uh, St StatsCans report with persons with disabilities. What's the difference between the one that we saw last year versus what you're referring to that was released several days ago on December 3rd? Um, yeah, sorry. Um, I'm not 100% sure I quite understand. Uh, but I think I might know what you're getting at. Uh, obviously, the one that was released last year, that was the first release from the, the 2017 CSD. Um, and over the last year, there have been a number of different releases, but this is sort of the second, I guess, big paper, is it? Yeah, so this is sort of the second big paper coming from it. So using the same data, I think maybe what you might be getting at, because somebody, I've heard that question before, and it's, um, are we redefining people with disabilities? Is this a different way of defining it? And so the, it's a complicated answer, but I'll start with no. Um, the, the, um, the screening questions are exactly the same, so you're still looking at the same population. So back uh, in 2010, <laughs> again, it takes a long time to, to get data right. Uh, back in 2010, we started redesigning the screening questions for disability. And by 2012, we, we had something called the disability screening questions. We refer to them as the DSQ. The DSQ uses the social model. And it was designed to make sure that we included people in that middle space as well as the stereotype. So it was always designed to be inclusive of uh, both dynamics and permanent sort of unchanging disabilities. So that's still being used. We haven't redefined it. So we still have that 6.2 million that you saw last year based upon that. But what these new questions uh, that are on the same survey uh, were designed to do was to have an, was to develop another lens or another dimension through which to understand, uh, be able to identify. So of those people, how many actually look like the stereotype? So it's the same data, the same definition overall. This is this is not a new definition of disability. It's another lens or another dimension through which to analyze it. Uh, if you could, uh, one short, quick question. We were given two questions to respond to over the course of the day. Unfortunately, a few of us don't understand the first question. Uh, it was the, the two question. It was the first one. Yeah, okay. So um, let me get to that. What are the strengths or weaknesses of using a relative 
approach to accessibility. So let me give you an example of relative accessibility. Maybe that will help. Um, all, uh, most of, I would say all of the instruments that I looked at um, were absolute accessibility, meaning that they met some um, measure that was on, um, uh, for example, a building code. Uh, was the, the door wide enough? Was it, um, you know, was it present? Um, it didn't, so, and if it was, then it was accessible. But it didn't um, have to be at the front of the building um, where everybody could enter. So a person in a wheelchair might have to go around to the back of the building um, and not go with the front door with uh, his coworkers to go to the event. Um, that, um, and when we talk about relative accessibility, we're talking about um, coworkers all being able to enter the same door, all being able to get to the same event, all being able to participate as fully as the person next to them that isn't in a wheelchair. Um, and um, I don't mean to imply that we're looking at just physical disabilities. We're looking across disabilities, and I was simply using that um, as an example of relative accessibility. So um, in order to meet relative accessibility, um, as I mentioned, the ACA, um, the CRPD, and the human rights all look at, or all the, co the concepts within that, the vision is for an equal and um, uh, independent and free choice in places and spaces. Right. Um, and so when we talk about relative accessibility, we're introducing a concept that what hasn't been tested before, hasn't been designed in a module, and is that the right one? Should we be looking at something else? Or, you know, should we be looking at accessibility, relative accessibility? And if so, um, you know, how, how do we go about designing that? Um, and, and that's where we're at right now in terms of um, conceptualizing that concept. I hope that answered the question. Thank you. It's Jason again from the Public Prosecution Service of Canada. My question's for Tabitha. It's just regarding the, uh, your, I guess your starting point for doing this uh, UNCRPT review. Two-part question. One is, what is your starting point? And two is, what, if any, are your priority areas? Thanks. Thank you for the question. That's, uh, that's an excellent uh, question. Um, and so uh, we're just working on the starting point right now. I think we, we are trying to come at this, you know, uh, so I'll back it up a step. Um, you know, Canada ratified the CRPD in 2010 uh, and has, you know, not designated a monitoring mechanism uh, for the last nine years. Um, in that time, various other countries have established frameworks uh, they've got indicators, they've got models, they've got those kinds of things. So there are models out there. I guess uh, that's all to say that our starting point here is, is to take all of that under advisement, uh, but to really view this as an opportunity to build something that is a Made in Canada model uh, that works for us. What we find lacking in a lot of the models, uh, there's a very heavy focus on indicators and numbers and uh, not a good way of monitoring actual lived experience. Uh, and so it's a question we're working through right now in those consultations that we're doing um, to figure out how do we, what, we're, what we'll be starting with is defining what are the principles here? Uh, what is it that people expect um, before we start getting into the question of how do we get there? Uh, so, it, it kind of looking at two parts. So, uh, again, we're at the beginning of the process, um, but stay tuned. In terms of priorities, that'll be another focus area of the consultation. Obviously, the CRPD is vast, uh, and so, so we will need to establish some priorities. Um, and so, again, that's something that we, we're starting with no presuppositions of what those things are. Thank you. I'm going to take a couple of the questions from Slido. One of them um, asked, are the benefits reported here taking into account the costs and trade-off of, of making Canada accessible and inclusive? And I, I think that relates to what I, the little bit of a presentation I gave at the beginning. And no, it doesn't. That's just the benefit side. The next stage of that 
project is actually do, to do the cost side so that we can put the two together to do a cost benefit analysis and get the net benefit from, from that picture and that analysis. Um, another question was just about the, are the PowerPoints available from these presentations and yes they are available and if they're not up on the website currently we'll be putting them up shortly. Um, do we want to take another one from the floor? I just want to interject for a minute and say that I've added a live poll to Slido for Pamela's questions. Okay. So if people wanted to respond in there then we can just forward those response directly to Pamela. That would be great. Thank you very much. Um, data folks, uh, I'm John Ray, Council of Canadians with Disabilities. I think we within CCD want to connect with whomever of you is the point person on this to talk about things like disaggregated data and so forth. Who is the person, wh whomever of you is the person I need, could you come and find me at some point today, please? Yes, it'll likely be me, so yes, absolutely. What's that? It'll who's who's the, who's the person I need? It'll likely be me, Mike Burns. So come see me Mike. at the break and okay. we can have a talk conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think John may not actually be able to see you, so he might ask you to come see him. Okay, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Find me, please. I see you. No we'll worries. We'll take one more question from the floor and then one more question from Slido. I'm going to phrase this in about two questions. will be very brief. Um, Within the, the, the CSD, Canadian Survey on Disability, um, the current one seems to miss the point on provincial level data on employment rates of people with disabilities, and as well, area specific data as in uh, numbers of people with disabilities that live in a, a given certain area, which is, and this data is critically needed by nonprofits. So within the development of the 2022 CSD, are there any plans to include provincial level data on the employment rate of people living with disabilities and area specific information as to the amount of people living with disabilities in a given certain area? Thank you. Um, maybe I can answer, I can answer this. Um, yeah. Can anybody hear me? Uh, if I understand your question, and it's a question that we get a lot, which is, um, can you give me geogra geographic specific yeah. data? Okay, the issue with it is um, with the CSD, <clears throat> because we're taking a sample and not the whole population, um, we, we have to um, recognize that once we start to draw down into the data more and more, especially when we get into specific areas, um, the data is not reliable at that level. We definitely provide at least at the uh, geography level at province and territories. Depending on the specifics of the question of the, what you'd be looking for, it may be possible to drill down further into certain areas. However, um, I know certainly for me and my, my analytical team, um, we wouldn't be able to say off the cuff if, if you came in with a request until we had a chance to run the data to make sure that are these numbers reliable enough that we can release them? Because we do recognize that what people are most interested in is the um, is specific areas. Uh, so the answer is not that no, we can't. The answer is it really depends on what you're looking for. And even then, what we would have to do then is to go back to our data and see is, are these numbers that we can actually release, are they reliable? Do we feel confident in these numbers? And so, um, unfortunately, I can't give you a yes or no to that question, but I at least acknowledge that it is something that we always get coming back to us, is those kinds of requests. Thank you. And just one last question now from Slido. Um, this is for, for Tabitha. Um, now that the Accessible Canada Act is law, do you expect a spike in the number of complaints in different areas such as service provision, procurement, et cetera? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so what I could say, uh, it, it, you know, it's hard to anticipate these things. Certainly we won't be seeing complaints specific to the application of the Accessible Canada Act until we have um, regulations. Uh, and so we don't know when exactly that will be. Um, there's the ability to file complaints. Uh, and so certainly there'll be a, a certain number of complaints uh, that come in with respect to that. Uh, it's an open been question, I think, uh, whether complaints can concurrently be filed under the Canadian Human Rights Act. I don't think that that's 
as yet settled uh, that it is, you know, it, it, that being able to file a, a complaint under the Accessible Canada Act precludes someone from filing under the, um, the Canadian Human Rights Act. To the extent that pieces of legislation like the ACA uh, increase awareness uh, about what rights and obligations actually are, uh, I think those things always tend to increase the number of complaints that we receive. And that's, that's not a bad thing. That's, a, that's actually a, a, quite a good thing, um, that people become more aware of the fact that they do have rights uh, in this area. And so, uh, and I guess the last thing I would say is overall, um, over the last number of years, I can, I can tell you that we have at the commission uh, seen an incredible increase in the number of human rights complaints that we receive across all grounds. The numbers on disability, are, they still make up more than half of our complaints. So uh, because we're getting more complaints all, overall, that means we're getting more complaints relating to disability as well. Um, and, and those continue to be about employment and accessibility and all of those kinds of things. So hard to say for sure, but yeah, probably, it, it probably, <laughs> probably will be, <laughs> you know, if I were a betting woman, <laughs> I, would, I would guess, yep. <laughs> okay. okay, well, uh, that, uh, I'll end it there. Thank you very much once again uh, for our panelists, your presentations, greatly appreciate your time and insights. Thank you. Another round of applause, please.